get a mentor. Hey, it's Nina Carmichael. We made these videos is probably because you're the most ambitious person in your circle. You know you're capable of more and you get that push by surround yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, my husband, Evan Carmichael, the skills everybody wants to success needs to develop. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Become better at selling. People are afraid of selling. You're afraid you're gonna get rejected. You're afraid you're gonna be seen as a greedy, slimy, selfish salesperson. The reality though is you offer a fantastic product or service. You can help people. And if you can't sell to them, they may never get the help that they so desperately need. You can do sales in an ethical way that are true to your core values. You must. Your business and your customers depend on it. So I used to have a bigger version to selling. I used to think, you know, you have to have a big ego to do. I didn't want to rip people off. I didn't want people to think that I was trying to, you know, squeeze them out of money. I didn't want to get rejected. All of the typical fears that I think people have when they get into sales. And I still don't use sales as my primary tactic to go out and get business. But when you see an opportunity to help somebody, you have to give them your best effort to help them. And I had to get more into sales because I saw entrepreneurs who were struggling who were not getting the help that they needed and I knew I can help them, but I wasn't really passionate about selling what I was selling. I was constantly worried and living in fear. And when you live in fear, you don't make smart decisions. And I got more into it because I saw people who were failing, who, who should have used my help, who I could have helped and I didn't step up and then they failed and they went out of business and they made bad mistakes. I own that. That's my responsibility. That was my fault. I could have helped and I didn't. I should have sold myself harder and I didn't. And I let everybody down. I let them down, I let myself down. And in a broader sense, I let my family down, my community down. I have a responsibility to grow this business and to help more people. And that involves me selling myself. So fast forward to today, I had two guys on my morning show who wanted to be thought leaders. They wanted to have books, they wanted to be speakers, they wanted to be at the front of the room, they wanted to build their social media accounts and profiles. They wanted to be seen, recognized as experts in their industries, thought leaders. I do a workshop twice a year in Toronto for three days, helping people make money as thought leaders. And I break down my exact strategies, how I grow on YouTube, how I grow on Instagram, what your content strategy should be, how to make videos, how to come up with ideas, how to create content, how to win, how to get speaking gigs, how to get a book deal, all of it. Be me, be the Evan Carmichael of your industry. I break down how to do it, but not just a breakdown, not just, hey, let's sit in the room and, and learn from my ideas. We're going to work with you to do it. I take 15 people twice a year and I work through exactly how to do it. And then you're taking your phone out and you're making content. You're making videos and I'm going to be sitting there talking to you and helping you do it. Then you get in front of the camera and you have to make a video and I'm going to be behind the camera with my team telling you, nope, nope, again, do it again. Say it like this. Nope, not quite. Nope. Keep going. A lot of personalized one-on-one -on -one mentorship. If you want to be a thought leader, it's among the best training in the world. You need to do it. If you have the budget, you can make the time free. You should come out and do it. And so I'm talking to these two people who want to be thought leaders and I have the knowledge and I have the training to help them. I think that three day event should be something that they at least are aware of. And so with one of them, I walk through the entire process of what I cover in the event. And I'm, I'm trying to do it in a way that brings them value, obviously. And then the other one, I quickly mentioned it and then followed up in the DM on Instagram to say, Hey, here's the event. I think it'd be good for you. Maybe they come, maybe they don't come. Maybe some of them feel like they're being sold to. I don't think so because it was when it's genuine, when they can feel your passion and love and energy and care and desire to help them. That's what breaks through. If you don't actually care about the end consumer, if you see somebody coming to those, oh, that person's my next car, that person's my next suit, that person's my next X, Y, Z, right? My next watch. If that's the mindset and attitude, then they won't feel the care. They're going to feel like they're being sold to and being ripped off. But when you have the energy, compassion, heart to help, and you know that this is the thing that they should do, I think it's your responsibility to go off and tell them about it. When you believe in what you're selling and when you believe that it's actually the right thing for that person, it's your responsibility to sell it. 
So I'm going to give you a three-step process that will help you be a better salesperson and bring in more sales to your business. Step number one, put yourself in their shoes. The best salespeople are listeners. So you listen, listen, what do they need? What do they want? What are they looking for? You're listening, you're listening, you're listening. You try to imagine as you as them. You are them. You want to jump into their body. <laughs> you are them. You're putting yourself in their shoes and getting a deep understanding for what their problems are right now. Number two, let them feel your understanding and your passion. Because you put yourself in their shoes, now they feel like you understand them. Like this, this person understands me. Evan understands me. He knows exactly what I'm going through. That's what you want them to feel. This person knows exactly you. You know exactly what your customer is going through and they feel it. Because when they feel like you understand them and their problem, they're way more willing to listen to you. Otherwise, they feel like they're being sold to. So one, you understand them. And then two, you are passionate about helping them solve the problem. You are passionate. You firmly believe in the thing. Don't recommend something that you don't believe in. You're passionate about this thing that you're selling that can get them a real result that is going to make them money or take a problem away from them. You have to believe in what you're selling. And then step number three, when you're 85% sure, tell them what to do. I have a theory that when you're 85% sure, you're 100% sure. When you are 85% certain about something, you have to jump to 100. There's no way ever to be 100% certain. It's not possible. It's only for things looking backwards, right? I, I got this coffee from Tim Hortons today and it's a dark roast and I know what a dark roast black coffee tastes like, but maybe today it's burnt. I don't know what it, exactly it's going to taste like today until I've already tried it. You can only know with 100% certainty looking backwards, not forwards. And so you need to get to a point where you feel 100% certain about something. And so for me, when I'm 85% certain, I'm 100. I act like I'm 100 because I become 100. Here's why. And this isn't just for selling to clients. It's, it's relationships, it's partners, it's mentoring, it's suppliers, it's investing, it's everything. If you're trying to help somebody down a path, you know something, you have an expertise, you're trying to help them down that path. They're uncertain about it. They're looking for a solution. They're in pain mode. They may not even think there's a solution, but you know you have one. If you have a little bit of doubt, because there's always some doubt, right? You're never 100% certain looking forward. If you have a little bit of doubt and they are full of doubt, they're going to hang on to the doubt. That little bit of doubt that you have is going to be the reason why not to listen to you. Even though you're 85% plus certain. That 15% chance that you're going to be wrong means they don't do anything. And so when you are 85% certain, you have to go to 100. You tell them what to do. You say, this is the best thing for you. I believe it will work for you. I believe it will solve your problems. When you're 85% sure, you're 100. If you want more confidence and motivation, please check out our 254 series. The link is in the description below. Dramatically in improve the chance of you getting your deal. They'll look over your proposal. They will give you feedback, suggestions, how to tweak your proposal. If you've never done it before, and I'm going through this process right now. Successful people take responsibility for where they are in life. Find whatever the smallest first step is, and then the smallest next step is, and continue to build those steps. And when you look back, you'll have realized that you made some pretty significant progress. Rule number two, always look for new skills. You will never lose in life if you have valuable skills. You won't lose your house, you won't lose your car, you won't lose your clients if you have a skill that brings people value. The economy can collapse, the algorithms can change, but as long as you have a skill that solves problems for people, you will be safe. So I'm seeing this a lot in the YouTube world now. Uh, I have a new course out uh, helping people get to a million subscribers on YouTube. We can link up the description there if you want in. And people are saying, well, should I still do YouTube? Is it too late? Like uh, YouTube won't be here in five years or 10 years, or maybe it's gonna be the next thing that I should hop on. It's not about the platform. Like right now it's winning the platform that is currently winning. You need to crush it, right? Like YouTube should be your home. If you're trying to make an impact, you're trying to be a thought leader, you have a message to spread, YouTube has to be your number one place. It just has to be right now. Otherwise, you're, you're not making a smart decision. But whether YouTube is still around in 20 years, five years, doesn't matter. Because the skill set that you learn, you can take anywhere. The ability to communicate, you could take to any platform. You could take to the next thing. I don't anticipate YouTube still being around in 20 years, but my ability to make videos, talk into a lens, that's not gonna go away. That can serve me for life, right? Whether that's VR Evan or hologram Evan, you know, coming into your living room, that's, that's gonna be me. That's gonna be amazing. I'm pumped, I look forward to it. 
any algorithm change that people are freaking out about, anybody who's complaining about the economy going down or the algorithm changing, you've already lost. That's a losing mindset. When I was first starting my YouTube channel, uh, I always saw the algorithm as a chance to win, right? You should see, if you're a small creator on any platform, YouTube, Instagram, anything, and the algorithm shifts, that's your greatest advantage. You should be cheering. You should want more algorithm changes. If you look at a, a traditional, established, boring market, uh, it's hard to win. Real estate could be hard to win, right? Financial markets can be hard to win. It's not that it's not possible, it's just hard to win because there's a lot of people who have, who have decades of experience, no more than you, and it's hard to close that gap of experience. With social media, with YouTube, every time there's a big algorithm change, the people who are experts at the last thing, they're crying instead of adjusting. That's how you win. That's how you get ahead of them. That's how you become the top dog is because you're going to go learn the new algorithm when everybody is wishing and hoping that the old algorithm comes back. And this happens for every platform. It happened for Facebook. Every time they changed your algorithm or updated the, the feed and what was shown there, people always freak out and complain and they sign, they want petitions and like, let's go back to how it used to be. Don't sign those petitions. Don't jump on that penguin. That is loser thinking. Never, ever, 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 ever do that. It's loser thinking. And that's how most people think. That's a mindset shift that I want to make for the collective, but more importantly for you. That whenever there's a big change, embrace it. Go all in on it. Learn it. That's how you're going to leapfrog everybody else. So the faster the rate of change, the more you should be cheering. I still get pumped for an algorithm change. Me. I mean, now I'm at, now I'm closer to the top, right? I mean, I don't know what the top is. I got 2 million subscribers and 300 million views and all these channels. I still love it. Anytime an algorithm change comes out, I'm still pumped. Train yourself. Like a change is coming, I'm pumped. Get excited. Because there's still people who are ahead of me or even the people below me that I'm competing with for, for attention and for space. Uh, if they're sitting there complaining about how it's changed and, and they're dropping in their views, awesome. I'll pick up those views because I'm going to learn what the new algorithm is all about. Same thing with the economy. When the economy crashes, everybody who's complaining about how it used to be, they're not going to win. It's comforting to join a club and wish things to be how they used to be, but we're not going back to that. So the faster you realize that and make improvements, the faster you can learn and actually build a great business. Some of the greatest businesses in the world were built in recession, in depression. That could be you if you decide to be. Let's hop back to skills for a second. I look at Jake Paul, Logan Paul. They started on Vine, right? Vine was, was their claim to fame. They had tons of success in making these super short videos. Vine gets shut down, right? Boom, gone. This is a don't put all your eggs in one basket. I think that's loser thinking too. It's loser thinking. They went all in on Vine and, and then Vine got shut down. Oh no. What did they do? They moved to YouTube and started crushing it. Millions of subscribers. Look at their growth on YouTube over the past, I don't know, two years, three years. Blew up. Why? They didn't just come out of nowhere. They had the skill set. They had the skill set that they learned from doing the thing, right? The skill set to make a good video, they then brought to a new platform. If YouTube goes away, you're learning the skill set of how to communicate, how to make great videos that whatever comes next. People were freaking out about the FTC coming in and cop on YouTube. Okay, so if kids aren't able to get content on YouTube, where are they gonna go? Go be there. Instead of trying to fight what is already happening, go be at the place where the kids are gonna be. Embrace the change. That's where you that's where you can win. When everybody else is fighting and angry and screaming and yelling and complaining and wishing that it used to be or quitting the platform and getting upset, go be where they're gonna be. It's it's easy, it's a simple win. Most people don't have that mindset. It's why most people lose. It's why most businesses can evolve. Most, most businesses shut down. It's people very rarely transition from one platform to another, from one business to another, even though they have the skill sets and capabilities to do so because they don't have the mindset to do so. People who crushed MySpace, very few of them are still around on different platforms. Look at, look at Hollywood. The Rock is doing it. Will Smith is doing it, moving from Hollywood films to YouTube. Where's Brad Pitt? Where's George Clooney? Like they're in a dying industry. They should be embracing YouTube. They don't want to. They have the skills. They have the skills. It's transferable. You don't think George Clooney could come in and crush YouTube if he wanted to? Of course he could. Calling you out, George Clooney. Let's go. Make it happen. Right? It's just about picking up the skill set. That will keep you safe in any environment. But it's also having a mindset to follow through and try the new things instead of complaining about the changes that are currently happening. Rule number three, master productivity. What matters is that you're productive that you get results, that you stop wasting time. 
Too many people default to thinking that if they just wake up an hour earlier, they're gonna be way more productive. If you're not productive in a 16 hour day, what makes you think that you're gonna be more productive in a 17 hour day when you have less sleep? So this is a interesting message and timing for me right now because I I love beating the sun up. I love it. I, I love working. I like it's my default state. If Nina is off on a Friday night with her friends or something, 80% chance I'm working. I love it. I look forward to it. When I go close my eyes, I can't wait for it to be the next day. Like I'm pumped to go off and do the work. I recently did a sleep study and my doctor was concerned I wasn't getting enough quality sleep. So I went to go do a sleep study and the doctor, after going through the results, uh, told me that I need to be sleeping eight and a half hours to nine hours a night. And it, and it like super disappointed me. Eight and a half hours to nine hours? Are you kidding me? I, I'm trying to go from, I was trying to go from eight to seven. I was waking up after eight hours sleep and, and feeling still a little bit tired. And so that's why my doctor recommended even going to the sleep study. And I'm trying to figure out how do I hack it to get down to seven and still be fully functional, not, not be, you know, lazy and slow and not having my cognition. And uh, yeah, he said, I need to be sleeping eight and a half to nine hours a night. And he said, is that, is that normal? Like, are you not worried? He's like, no, as long as you're under 10, it's normal. People range from six to 10 and, and they're totally fine. Like this sucks. I mean, I'm not happy about it. I'm still looking at how can I hack my sleep more? And we've tried a lot. I have the chili pad. We've got, you know, meditation before sleeping. I'm lying on the bed of nails with the thing behind me, the pillow, the nail pillow. Uh, no, you know, phones or computers, X amount of time before going to bed, red light filters on everything, red lights, no lights.